All right, we are on with Madison Horn. And uh, Madison, you have announced that you are running for the United States Senate in Oklahoma, uh, specifically targeting uh, James Lankford's seat, uh, which of course is what's you know gonna be up for, for grabs next year. Um, and I, the first thing I noticed, well, let me ask you my traditional first question of anybody <laughs> running for higher office, which is, are you nuts? Why would you wanna do that? Um, well, I think your first question is, am I nuts? Um, I don't think that I am, but maybe others will, will claim differently, uh, jokes aside. Um, so if you have done any research, I mean, I'm sure you have, um, as just a, someone that's in journalism, you know, I was taught very, very early the importance of community. Um, you know, being from Stillwell, Oklahoma, if you know Stillwell, then it's it's a very, very humble, humble town. And, you know, my family didn't have a ton. Now I was taken care of as a child, certainly, but my community truly, truly raised me. Um, you know, living in different families' homes and different friends' homes, uh, really growing up. And you know, my father was a teacher his entire career and a cattleman. And you know, my grandmother was a teacher, you know, family full of farmers as well. And when something was awry or something needed to get done or someone needed help, then there was no question. It was just assumed that you were going to do it. Sometimes those questions wouldn't even have to be asked. Someone is going to step up and do it. So, you know, the past four years in, well, I'm going to say even before the last four years, you know, seeing the country go in the direction that it has and the lack of conversation across the aisle, the lack of servant leaders um, has really just been incredibly frustrating to see and to see the impact on a population of individuals that need their government to work for them as it is designed. Right. And that is what we've gotten away from. So, you know, whether it be through my career working in cybersecurity or working within education to also uh, work with kids in, in the cyber world, um, or even what we've seen from, from COVID um, and the adaptations that Oklahoma wasn't able to, to kind of jump through just because of the lack of broad. I mean, it's all across the board, then, you know, anyone can look at you know, the past couple of years and say, okay, something is really broken. Now who's going to fix it? And the who is going to fix it? Well, it's clearly not the current leadership that's in place because something would have been done, you know, over the past, what, uh, six, now we're at, will be nine years that they've been office. Um, so I think not only have I have lost hope in our current leadership and our government, I think a lot of Oklahoma has. And so that has pulled me to kind of take action. So looking at your website, it, it was interesting to me that you are running as Democrat, but yeah. you describe yourself as a conservative. And, sure. and, and that goes to my, you know, I've said many times, um, an Oklahoma Democrat is not a Massachusetts Democrat, is not a California Democrat. You, you're not going to survive politically in Oklahoma, you know, that far left to center. I mean, it just is what sure. it is. Sure. Uh, but on the other hand, Oklahoma has a populist bent. We were at one time the most socialist state in the country and going back mm -hmm. about 100 years now, but we were. Uh, we, we, we've... Uh, come up with people like, I don't know, Woody Guthrie and Will Rogers. So there's clearly some left of center <laughs> thought. Out sure. there. I don't know how much of it um, occurs in the strawberry capital of the world. Uh, they're <laughs> still well, but, but tell me, explain to me a, you know, how, how you balance conservatism and being a Democrat. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and B, do you but... think that will get you where you need to be to be competitive in this race? Cause it's not going to be an easy race. Sure. So you asked two questions there, you know, and, and I love that you did because, you know, I think this, I don't think I know that, you know, this term that I've used conservative has really sent some people on a spiral of who the heck is Madison Horn and what is this label conservative? And, you know, I think the other thing that people have, you know, recognized is there's not Democrat on my website. It's not on any of my literature. And that does not mean that I am not running as a Democrat. I am a very, very, very proud Democrat. 
But in the initial conversation, the first question that you asked me, why am I running? You know, I am, I, I don't believe that our government's working for us. I don't believe that there's bipartisan conversations happening. So I can't encourage, you know, partisan conversations happening if, you know, I don't open the conversations across the aisle and, and I put labels on myself. It automatically puts a set of ideas of who Madison Horn is. And so I want to strip those labels out. But I also want to recognize I am from the strawberry capital of the world, ridden through that parade so many times. That'll be another conversation. Um, but I, I grew up in a very conservative household. You know, it's it wasn't as if I could have everything that I wanted, but I also was set with a set of values that were founded in, you know, say that they're religious principles or just very strong moral principles. So I have some conservative values, but also to your point, I am a Democrat and I also spent five years in Atlanta. I spent five years in DC. I've traveled the world with my job and I understand, you know, progressive ideas and the idea that we need to move forward absolutely and there's social issues that people struggle with you know saying that well conservatives don't believe in these social issues well who said that they don't because if we talk about conservative values one of the conservative values is human equality you know we've just gotten this this term conservative has just gotten so spiraled into these negative connotations i think because of of where we are in the political climate. So, um, you know, that's how I see that word is the true traditional values in which conservatism is, is foundationally written. Not that I don't believe in progress because that's not who I am as, a, as an individual. I mean, I work in technology for God's sakes. There's nothing conservative about that. Um, but your second question there was, do I think that it will help me, you know, within this election. Absolutely. I do believe that it will help me. You know, that's not why I'm I'm using these terms by any means. I, I want to represent who I am because authenticity and my integrity are incredibly important throughout this process. But at the same time, like Oklahoma traditionally the state, if we talk about the principles of Oklahomans, but again, we've got to get away from the negative connotations that are around and we've got to get away from the labels. So, I mean, the negative con connotations that are attached to the word progressive these days, like progress right. is bad. What? You know, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it works both ways. You know, speaking of Stillwell, I did a really interesting uh, interview uh, about a month or two ago with uh, the, the folks from Redbird. And okay. this is a, a, a medical cannabis manufacturing facility that's going up in Stillwell. In fact, they're up and running. Mm -hmm. um, I forget how big they told me, but like it is massive and it is going to be employing hundreds of people. And so there is an example, medical cannabis, of something that none of our conservative leaders wanted. Didn't sure. think it would pass. Literally were like, <laughs> never happened weren't worried about it and then had 90 days to set up a, a program. And we're still mm -hmm. dealing with the chaos from all that. Sure. Um, that's a long way of, of, I guess, getting to the next question, which is, you know, how, how do you see um, Oklahoma moving forward? Because it does seem like we're sort of mired in this, this sort of um, mm, um, not happy place right now. Sure. With everybody yelling at everybody. I don't think Oklahoma is the only place that's happening. No, but it seems to be very strident here. And it's interesting that um, Mr. Lankford has drawn not one, but two Republican com opponents from the right. Okay. Like we need to go further that direction. And I, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's going to help uh, solve some of these, some of the yelling problems, but you know, yeah. how, how do you address some of that? Gosh, uh, I think you packed a lot in there. Where do you I'm, even start? I have start? a bad habit of doing that. <laughs> No, it's it's okay. I'm 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 giggling because I'm excited about the the questions and and kind of un, un, unwinding all that. Um, so let's start at the beginning. You talked about medical marijuana in you know beautiful beautiful Stillwell. Um, you know the fact that our state government didn't have a plan 
for that industry and still hasn't figured out is insanity. This isn't something that we have been dealing with for the past two years, three years, four years. When I was a child, then there was airplanes that would come around and actually spray um, marijuana that was growing naturally. So we've known as a state that this is something that organically grows and we're gonna have to figure out how to regulate it, right? So why haven't we gotten there? Because no one wants to tackle it for political reasons. Well, you know what happens when we don't address things for political reasons? It negatively impacts our constituents. And this specific topic is a hot button topic. And I say that because, you know, while I, I encourage new industries to come to Oklahoma and we, we regulate them appropriately, not to stifle, but so that it can work for the economy in Oklahoma and, and create diversity here. You know, this is a problem where, you know, the government hasn't stepped in and said, okay, well, you know, we need to create regulations around this so that our farmers can still have their livelihoods. Because a lot of these, these growing facilities, you know, are taking up local resources that then are taking away from, you know, other industries in the space. And, you know, we don't need to operate in a world of, you know, obviously resources are limited. We, we know that but we don't need to create a scarcity and be scared of regulation when we're just doing it to encourage growth in both areas while taking care of legacy econ the economy, right? So, you know, let's, let's say that that is the topic of, of marijuana in general, but overarching, you know, the economy in Oklahoma, you know, our legacy is in with, within, excuse me, the oil and gas space. Right. We, we can't get away from that and say, well, you know, with the new infrastructure bills coming in and this is going to just absolutely kill our economy and be scared of that. We absolutely can't. At some point, and I'm not saying tomorrow or eight years from now, then oil and gas is going to go away. I'm not saying that, but we need to prepare our industry for something for the 21st century. And I don't think that we have that forward thought of, well, how can we build on this legacy? We have some of the hardest working damn people. Can I say damn? I said damn. You just did. Go for it. <laughs> well, damn. So <laughs> we have some of the most hardworking people. We the, so why have we not figured out how to education systems that feed that, that spirit and being able to work with our hands, transition that into quality jobs. Like we just haven't figured that out yet. Instead, we want to say, well, you know, this industry is really great and I'm not going to pick on the trucking industry. Great industry creates a lot of phenomenal jobs for Oklahoma, but it also doesn't feed the economy in Oklahoma, right? So, you know, what are jobs that will help the economy in Oklahoma, keep our families in Oklahoma, keep young talent in Oklahoma so they don't have to seek outside of the state. You know, that would be my long-term goal. And, you know, if that's the one thing that I can impact, then, I mean, I would be just incredibly successful. And I, this is not something that I've seen James Lankford focus on. Let's talk about um, Senator Lankford for a minute. What, uh, sure. was there anything in particular that he's done that, that made you go, all right, that's it, I'm running? <laughs> or, or, or was or was it just more of a, uh, I guess, an accumulation over the, you mentioned the last four or five years. And look, we've all <laughs> seen what this country has been like the last four or five years, and we don't have to talk about why that happened. I think that's pretty obvious. What are but, you talking about? What happened? I'm talking just about kidding. some guy got elected that maybe, you know, that that was a mm, divisive figure. I'll just leave it there. Sure. Um, and Mr. Lankford has been really trying to stay on that. Um, stay in that tight wire without falling over one side or the other, without ticking off one side or the other more than he absolutely has to, because that's what politicians do. What is, what is your thoughts about, you know, was there something in particular that, that, that he did or said, or, or a policy that he has that you went, okay, I'm no, that's, that will not stand. I, I need to tackle that. Or is this just you wanting to turn things around writ large in the state of Oklahoma? Sure. Well, you know, listen, I'm not sitting here trolling James Langford every day. So let's be very clear. Um, like, never mind. Go ahead. 
um, you know, so there wasn't, there wasn't a defining moment that I was like, you know what, this is what has pissed me off about James Lankford. You know, honestly, I think that it has been a, a kind of domino effect, kind of one thing after another, but, you know, I want to, I want to back up to a word that I used earlier, which I think is so important and, and missing from politics. And it's the word integrity and, you know, actions should not be driven or decisions should not be driven based on the color of the flag in which you are representing. And what I mean by that to be very specific is which party you're representing, right? It is not about party politics because some of the things that the Democratic Party may back are not gonna be good for Oklahoma or some of the things that the Republican Party backs is not gonna be good for Oklahoma. So you have to vote and think about the impact of the constituents in which employ you. And you know, again, that is the problem with our government. Our government has basically kind of tipped over and the power is now at the very, very top between two individuals, which we shall not name, when it is supposed to be with the power, with the people, excuse me, the power is with the people. So we need to kind of change that narrative and empower people and remind them that they're the ones that make the decisions who put us in office in which how we should vote it is not the parties so you know i would say that is the biggest thing that has frustrated me overarching and what has been so frustrating to me i think watching james lankford vote it, it is very much based on party lines and he is trying to to walk both lines, but I don't understand where his convictions lie. Uh, and to me, that's not a leader. That's not someone who has integrity. It's someone who is making decisions purely to stay in office. And that is, it's actually sad and a huge disservice to the state. Um, and I think that we have seen the way that he has flip-flopped with different votes and different ideas based on which party um, is in favor. All right. So let's, um, I'm going to kind of go backwards here and talk a little bit about what you have been doing. Cause you mentioned you've been all over the world. You've, you know, um, you work in the field of cybersecurity. I don't know specifically what you do. Cause while I, I looked at your campaign website, I did not Google stock you, but, um, working in cybersecurity, that is, that is, uh, that's going to be important for defense of this country. It's yeah. important for, cause I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, the city has been hacked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, c companies, employers, people I know have had their lives just turned upside down by some dude in Nigeria or Smolensk. I don't know. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. doing these, these uh, ransomware attacks is, is America ready to fight the next cyber, the, the cyber war that is undoubtedly coming. This is going to be an aspect of warfare. Kind of already is. It absolutely already is. Yeah, sorry. This is a, it's an exciting topic. Um, you know, I'm, I love, love, love being a servant within the cybersecurity space. And, you know, I've been so blessed with so many amazing opportunities um, within this space. And, you know, I'll, I'll stop and go down a, a short little tangent and share a story. You know, you said that you went out and Googled me and you're like trying to figure out, you know, who's Madison, what has she done? You know, when I launched, um, there was there was some folks that were like, oh, this is definitely a deep fake account. Um, and they didn't believe that I was a real person. But, you know, it's it's funny. I've worked in cybersecurity for 10 years almost. And so I've intentionally kept myself off the internet. And so it just kind of made me giggle that, uh, you know, I was a deep fake account. Um, it just kind of like- Because they couldn't me find you a Facebook page? <laughs> so yeah, not real. exactly, okay. exactly. Standards have changed. Go ahead. No, but it's 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 comical and, and it kind of makes me laugh. Yes. But um, you know, to to give you a little bit of an insight into you know just my journey within cyber, you know, I was studying um, you know accounting and and business when I was in school. I had no intentions of going into cybersecurity, and and I kind of got recruited. I was a sophomore in college, and you know I had four jobs because I was poor and just trying to pay bills and pay for school. And I was working as a, a front desk person at a hotel 
And about six months after uh, the, the same group of consultants were traveling to this hotel, they got to know me and they said, you have such an incredible work ethic and people skills. Will you come work for us? And I was like, cybersecurity? I know nothing about this space. And, but at the same time, they offered me this professional career and this pathway that I could be an advocate for folks within the critical infrastructure space. And while I didn't really know what that meant, then I was like, well, this seems cool. I can kind of be a superhero within cybersecurity. So I'm in. So, you know, I, I jumped right into a space that I knew nothing about, but I knew that I could work harder than, than anybody else. And I was in rural substations and learning about the way that these plants operate. And it was, was an absolute blast. And it was all part of rural America. So I found this comfort um, in a space that, you know, I grew up in and I fell in love with it because I was becoming an advocate for folks like my dad, like other Oklahomans, but then learning an industry that, you know, has just grown so much and, and will never go away. And so it was phenomenal. Um, you know, my, I stayed there for a couple of years and then I, I joined a startup, which was so much fun. I love the startup space. Um, I got to be a part of an ethical hacking team. And so companies would hire us to basically achieve some type of objective, whether it would be transfer money out of a bank, or it would be to turn the lights off in a city or to broadcast something on the media, um, you know, just like this, right? Um, so I got to learn so much about different, uh, different industries, different systems, the way that these systems can be manipulated. I got to learn about the way disinformation is spread. I also, you know, the, the mindset within cybersecurity is that you validate and trust nothing, right? And so, you know, in, in my space, you kind of put this dark thinking on is, is what we call it. And it's to really emulate what, what is the bad guy thinking? What is, he, what is he trying to do? And putting in that mindset, then I had to learn, you know, what, are, what motivates terrorist organizations? Doesn't mean if it's foreign, domestic, whatever, you know, how do they form? How do they, what's their, what's their mindset? What are they, what are they after? Really, you know, got to see firsthand, you know, what our country is facing and what different industries are facing and how we need to combat that and how we're underprepared. But I also got to learn geopolitics, right? Because it's not as if our country is just hacking itself. Right. You know, while we see domestic threats, you know, obviously there are, there are global threats and you have to learn what motivates them. So I went back to school and studied homeland security and got to spend time, you know, really kind of um, educating myself more formally in this space. Um, and it was a phenomenal experience to, uh, you know, build those types of acumen. But, you know, fast forwarding here. I worked in incident response, so I worked on the other side. Um, I got to go find the hackers um, and really understand what you know in incident management and crisis management includes um, across the globe, which was very cool to experience and experience different cultures and, and grow respect for different cultures and, and people. Um, but you know, I got tired of, of serving corporate America, to be very, very, very frank. Um, you know, I wanted to get back to servant leadership. I wanted to get back to working for people. Um, so I, I came back to critical infrastructure thinking that that's where I needed to be. So, you know, that's where I, I sit now. I work within a global team, on a global team, working within critical infrastructure. Um, but it wasn't quite enough for me. Um, I knew that I could use my skills to serve a broader mass of people in a different way. And um, I, I think my skill set is actually truly, you know, I don't like talking about myself. I don't think anybody does. So, you know, I had to step back and like look at myself 
like almost a product and say, okay, you know, if I was looking for a leader for the 21st century, you know, what skill sets and what information do they, they need to be able to obtain? <clears throat> and you, we need desperately leaders that have, that understand technology. And if you look at our government, you know, it's, it's really lacking in tech literacy. So this is going to be something that, you know, I can help not just Oklahoma with, but, you know, from a national perspective and, you know, bring our country forward to the 21st century, whether that be modernization of national defenses, modernization of, of policy and regulations, and, you know, holding tech companies a accountable as, as well. So, Implementation of blockchain technology. Oh, and, yeah, and, that's a whole and, other conversation. And that could be in our taxes, in how we vote, in our <laughs> census, in there, it is Endless. I, I, I'll tell you, I do a show on uh, Sundays called uh, Cryptocurrencies with Matthew J. Moore. Matt's a very smart guy. Um, and he has managed to pound some of what, bl how blockchain works and how cryptocurrencies work and NFTs and all that into my head. Sure. I'm not going to pretend I understand it, but I have a kind of a glimmering sort of understanding of it, kind of the way I understand sort of internal combustion. <laughs> but, I, but I don't really care as long as sure. when I turn the key, the damn car starts. Just like I don't really care as long as when I go to check my wallet, the, the Bitcoin that I bought is actually there. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So we could go and and we'll talk again because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my gosh, we didn't even get into, you know, election integrity and, <sighs> and all that stuff. And people screaming about that in Oklahoma. Really? Where the guy won all 77 counties, the guy that you're, you know, whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more that we could go into, but I am just flat out of time. Plus I think this, no uh, this thing's going to die in a minute because I just have <laughs> a free version of zoom. So it's going to cut me off. Um, so Madison, I'll just ask any last thoughts before we wrap up real quick. Um, you know, no parting thoughts. I mean, thank you for taking the time and, and having the conversation. And, you know, I, I couldn't have planted bugs here, but, uh, you know, thank you for just, you know, getting to know who I am as a, as a, as an individual and asking me those questions of, you know, how I will serve and, you know, helping me get my message out of removing labels and, and really getting down to what Oklahoma needs. So thank you for the thoughtful questions. Uh, not at all. I'm just doing my job. Trust me, they'll they'll pay me for this time. <laughs> uh, but I'm also I'm also a resident of Oklahoma, and by a way, by the way, a lifelong independent voter, who um, who literally never has registered for a political party ever. And I think that puts me in the majority in this country. And so there is room for people of different party stripes and affiliations. <laughs> to win elections, and yes, even in Oklahoma. Brad Henry wasn't that long ago, right? It was. Speaking of Democrats who've been elected to office, are you in any relation to Kendra Horn at all? Is that So uh, you're the first person to ask me live. Uh, I am not related to Kendra Horn. I even had to go through my own family lineage, lineage and be like, how sure. is this possible? <laughs> how many Horn families are there in Oklahoma? Probably at least two. We can we can now confirm. All yeah, right, we great. Well, Madison Horn is a uh, is a conservative Democrat running for the United States Senate in the state of Oklahoma. She's uh, looking to unseat James Lankford. Um, again, I'm sure we'll chat again in the future. But thank you very much for taking the time today. I do appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, Russell. Have a fantastic day. <laughs> you too. I'm going to go ahead and end it. Namaste. We'll talk again. Sounds good. Bye.